So, Berto, have you heard of the Fire Festival, like the music festival in the Caribbean? Have you heard of it? I was there, baby. No, you weren't. Uh, what do you know about it? <laughs> oh, man. Well, so there was what I knew when it happened. Uh, I didn't know. I, I don't follow really like social media. Like, I don't, I'm not on Instagram, stuff like that. So I didn't know about it ahead of time. But when the catastrophe happened, I remember the news stories coming out. And I was so confused. I was like, what, what is this? Why would someone travel all the way to some island and then like, like get stuck there? It was really confusing. And then, for, and then months went by and I didn't really think about it again. And then the documentary came out and I watched both documentaries and, and read several online things about it. And I'm just flabbergasted and fascinated by the whole the fiasco. Yeah, so... We're going to talk about that in this episode. Uh, what do you say, Berto? Let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Hahn. I'm a therapist and a professor. And I could see myself being uh, interested in a ticket to the Fire Festival the way it was marketed. Who are you, Berto? My name is Umberto Castaneda. And there's no way in hell that would have paid like thousands of dollars just for the cabana. But anyways, I build... Um, furniture that has fake drawers in them. So as a synopsis, before we get into kind of going through the timeline of this, Fire Festival, if you don't know, was a music festival like um, Coachella or yeah. uh, it was all, it was kind of like a combination between, is it Co Coachella? Is yeah, that Coachella, Co Coachella and Burning, Woodstock 99 yeah, and Burning Man. And, and also kind of like Ibiza. Yes. Because Ibiza right. is like or Ibiza or whatever. He's Actually, I would say it's way closer to the that. Right, exactly. Yeah. It's like a week-long thing, a destination place that is hard to get to and you have to be super rich to get there and blah, blah, blah. And, and by the way, like you asked me, like, would you have, not only would I not, f because now I have the benefit of hindsight. No, no, no. All through that, like the last 20 years, so many times, friends of mine have gone to all those things. They've gone to Coachella and the, the whatever, all those festivals. And they've gone to Ibiza. Actually, they went to Ibiza. And when they came back, they had gone to Ibiza. And they've gone to Burning Man and Burning People and all these kinds of crazy things. And I got to tell you, I never once had FOMO or a desire to go in it. Like, Why? Because it's not for me. Like, I hate camping. I hate like complicated travel arrangements and shit where I got to be like beholden to some schedule with, well, and I also hate crowds. Like I hate crowds. Why would I want to be in a big crowd? That's it sounds horrible. In my old age, I'm getting more in that direction. I mean, I, I was joking that I, it would have appealed to me. I, there's no way I would have done it. I, I'm, I'm so, like Burning Man, for example, I, I've been invited to Burning Man for the past 20 years. And, Same, yeah. and yeah, it, it, I could imagine myself maybe going one day because I've heard just so many awesome things about it. But yeah, the downsides are are overwhelming to me. I'm I'm not a good camper. You and I, <laughs> you and I would never go camping willingly. <laughs> We'd never you know, be like, dude, let's go camping. Yeah, there's plenty of people in the Northwest. <laughs> there was actually a point in my life where I actually had to come out of the closet and say that I'm just not a camper. <laughs> and among my friends and everyone in Seattle, that's... that's Verboten. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, saying you're a Satanist when you live in the in Vatican City or yeah. something. And so... So true. So for me, it's it's not... Oh my gosh. It's uh, not super appealing. But in my older age, I'm finding that I like bigger music festivals like Bumbershoot or the, re the, the Amazon uh, festival that they actually decided not to do anymore. Uh, upstream, the yeah. one that was downtown. Like if um, I if I have to go downtown, and you know, be there for a few hours, I could probably do that. But you don't. But like, I don't. You don't go to Bumbershoot. I don't. You don't go to upstream. And people are like, "Oh, you missed this," and I'm like, "Oh, that sounds amazing." Yeah. <laughs> but to me, I, I'm finding I like it because it's you know, you buy one ticket and you get to go to all these different sure. things. And anyway, the point is, is that Fire Festival was in the Caribbean. It was uh, supposed to be on a small island, and there were supposed to be beautiful beaches, and they were going to have bands like Blink-182. Pablo Escobar's island. A major laser. And uh, they had all these, in the marketing materials, they had all these beautiful models on the beaches, and there were yachts and these villas and mm -hmm. all this stuff. And the tickets were very expensive, and you're supposed to be flying down there in a private jet and everything. 
and or a private the, like uh, avioneta, like a little like a charter plane. Charter. By the way, uh, it, I only knew Blink One Eighty Two and Migos out of that whole list. Yeah. Well, you am I just major, out of it? You haven't heard of yeah. I'm out of it. Well, that and I I I don't know. Yeah, we're either out of it or some of the acts weren't that big. Okay. Because if your if your biggest acts were Blink One Eighty Two and Major Lazer, then and Migos, you know, I've never heard of Major Lazer. Uh, you know, those aren't like. It, that's not like mass. That's not like right. um, I don't know who are the big names. Tiesto or something or uh, uh, chain smokers. Are they still big? Um, so, but you know, so a lot of people bought tickets. The from the minute the guests arrived, everyone started realizing that the entire thing was in shambles. Everything fell apart immediately within hours. People were trying to get off the island. This was supposed to be like a week long festival yeah. or at least a weekend. two weekends. Yeah, and within minutes people were like get us out of here and it was this big media shitstorm but let's go into the history what do you say yeah let's do it so originally um fire uh, well so let's go back so uh billy mcfarland is the founder of fire festival oh billy and before he created fire and the fire festival he, he created a credit card do you remember this. I didn't know about it until all this came out. I had never heard. Did you hear about that credit card back in the day? No, we wouldn't have. Because it was East Coast, right? It was New York or City. New York. It was just New York. New York City, yeah. So Metallico or? Uh, Magnesis. Magnesis, yeah. Magnesis. So <laughs> this guy, Billy McFarlane in New York City, he's young, probably like 22, 23 years old. And he's uh, an entrepreneur and wants to do something like that. And he creates this exclusive credit card. Yeah. Which on its face, when I was watching the documentary, I'm like, who's going to fall for that bullshit? Like, oh, I know a lot of people that would have fallen for that. Right. Bullshit. Well, we'll get into that <laughs> later because you and I know a lot of people like this. Yeah. Well, at least in this kind of, that would have run in the similar circles. In the exact circles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you and I are adjacent to this world yeah. in such a way that I think was... As I was watching this, I was like, oh my God, I'm reminded of that, yeah. of that click of people we knew, right. you know? And so Billy McFarland starts his credit card, Magnesis. It's an exclusive credit card. They offer deals. There's like a clubhouse in New York City that's only available to people who have this credit card. It has a $250 fee and it's just a regular visa, but it has a $250 annual fee. I mean, uh, Patrick Bateman would have been the first one with one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it gets you into events and Ja Rule started getting involved in this as well. And I totally get this because at first when I'm watching this and documentary, I'm like, who would get this? But I've done similar things. Like I was a big Yelper back in the day Yeah, in terms of I was involved with the Yelp community. So Yelp, <clears throat> right. what, and I think they still do, if you were an elite member of Yelp, meaning you were kind of a verified, you had to go through this verification process you could attend exclusive Yelp events. Right. And they would they would rent out a club or a restaurant or something and you'd get free drinks, free food, free swag. Everything, Sweet. Everything was free and it, it was fun. And you'd feel special. You felt special. Yeah. Even though it was like, you know, not that big of a deal, but there was, it, it felt, it felt great. In fact, I still have a lunch pail, a Yelp lunch pail. Oh, wow. And actually, I don't know if, do you remember the, the red armband that I would wear when I would play music? Yeah. That's a Yelp armband. Oh, that was from the swag. Cause that's funny. Just a little side note on that. I play electric guitar so badly and so uh, hardly. Oh no! That my wrist hits the strings and the the bridge really hard. Oh. That I would I would bleed because I would over the okay. You know, playing <laughs> one or two hours and just banging my hand against my electric guitar, I'd eventually right. start to bleed, and I would blood would go everywhere and so oh my god so i started wearing this this armband on my i'd have to wear a long sleeve shirt or an armband anyway and it, i used the yelp uh swag thing for that, <laughs> that anyway came in so, handy. <laughs> so magnesis billy mcfarland again he's in his early 20s and he creates all this buzz and uh you know just to take a snapshot of billy mcfarland and his personality because we're going to get into that yeah so imagine you're in your early 20s yep you own a credit card. Yeah. People are buying it. Ja Rule is interested in you. Right. Which is funny because Ja Rule was probably popular before he was born. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> or totally. around the time he was a child. But anyway. 
and he is creating his events and he's and he's being interviewed at at conventions absolutely yeah as like this up and coming genius yeah in in business and people kiss your ass you know we've so we've been in this world yep. you and i have been in the the club dj exclusive you know model circles in seattle right. where like I'll never forget, um, just to, as an anecdote, um, you and I were at a club one time, mm -hmm. and we have friends in this world. We're not really in the world, but no. we, we have close. We, we were the people that always got the free entrance and skipped to the front of the line because of our friends who were the ones running those nights. Right, they were the ones running yeah. it. We were the hangers on. Yeah, and so. We're at the club and, you know, we're getting all the VIP, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes they literally have a roped off section for right. VIP people. And then there's always an after party. Yeah. So then we go to the after party, which is at one of the clicky people's houses. Right. And at this point, you know, there's a point in the night when the, the clicky people are like, well, we have to sort of pare this down because we can't invite everybody. Right. It has to be exclusive. <laughs> we don't want all these yahoos coming. We only want some of some, some of, of the yahoos. Yeah. So we were included in that in that group. that first pairing. <laughs> so 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 it pairs down. Now you feel even more exclusive, right? Because you're like the VIP of the VIP, and it's all kind of framed in that way. You know, it's right. not it's not like because if you and I were out and we're like, hey, let's go to another location. Um, we wouldn't be like, well, who do we pare down? No. <laughs> we would just go like, no. let's go, let's, you know? Yeah. But there's this kind of obsession with like, with trying to- The uh, penis. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just very, it's this constant, because the thing about clubs is that successful clubs have a VIP air to them. Yeah. You know? We were a part of the, this club, this, uh, this culture, this, which is totally related to this fire festival culture, by the way. Totally. Um, is that some clubs would, be, you know, th these new clubs would crop up or it would change ownership or it would change its vibe. Yeah. And suddenly it would be the it club yeah, yeah. where there'd be a line around the block and there'd be a club two blocks away that used to be cool that no one goes to anymore. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and there's nothing different about... <laughs> same music, same people, whatever. Yeah. Same, <laughs> same alcohol. Same drinks. <laughs> yeah. And actually it's, same bartenders because like they worked in both places. <laughs> it's, it's just buzz, right? Yeah. And so the way you create buzz is by creating uh, this exclusive thing. Studio to it. 54. <laughs> and, and you, uh, these clubs, and I would watch it because, you know, we would, we would be right. behind the scenes. They would say to the bouncer, don't let in enough people so that there's no line. Right. Make sure there's always a line. Mm-hmm arbitrarily make sure there's all, you know, cause I remember there'd be times when we would wait in line or we would see a line and we'd get in and we walk in. No one's it's in. like, there's, yeah, it's not at capacity. Right. Right. And we're like, why aren't you just letting everyone in? <laughs> so, so we, so we go to the second party. Now, so now we're in the VIP of the VIP. Oh, and by, and by the way, I, I totally underappreciated what we were allowed to do because since i didn't really care about the the acts because it was usually like electronic djs whom i barely even knew for me it was like my friend invited me to come out on the town so i'd be if i was available i'd be like oh that sounds cool and and i guess i didn't at the time really put together oh i'm getting to cut in line in front of, it was neat because i didn't have to wait in line but I, I i guess i didn't appreciate fully the thing we were getting to do, which was, hey, very few people are getting to go into this club to see this one dude. Totally. Or whoever play. And well, and they would talk about it that way. Yeah. You know, they'd be like, you know, like with, with one of our friends, he was a club promoter. Right. And he would often be like, you know, we'd be in a club or something and he'd be like, oh, you know, I bet you I could get us into the VIP lounge. Right. And I'd be like, uh, oh, <laughs> I don't care. Cool if you do. <laughs> yeah. And he'd be like, no, no, no. We'll, you know, I can get us in. And I'd right, be right. like, uh, okay, if that's where we're going. Uh, to yeah. me, I didn't, it didn't matter to me. But to him. Because we're hanging out with our friends, right? right like to me, I'm just like, I, you know, I'm just, yeah. I don't care where we're at. Yeah. 
But <laughs> and, and oftentimes we get into the VIP lounge and it'd be, it's the same thing. It'd be the same or boring. Yeah, yeah, totally. Because actually, there's only like you're the only ones in there. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, it, it was so funny. There are some of those areas where the only difference between VIP and not VIP is the little rope. Yeah. And now you're sitting on the other side of the rope. Da, da, da. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's so dumb. And there, and I would get kind of convinced, uh, like, oh shit, I can get the VIP. Like that's pretty. <laughs> they, this, they joke about that in extras, the the Ricky Gervais show. There's one part where he gets into the VIP and he sits down, and right next to him, his his friend sits down just on the other side of the rope, and yeah. then he's all annoyed. He's like, ah, oh, goddamn. Yeah, yeah. So so anyway, we go to the VIP of the VIP someone's yeah. house. And then at a certain point, they, they tell everyone to clear out. Right. They're like, everyone clear out. So, so I go home. The next day or something, I you know, run into our friends, and they're like talking about having extended the night to a, to a third VIP circle. Oh. You know, they're, they're, like, they're like, yeah, you know, and then we did this. And I'm like, wait, I thought we all left. He's like, <laughs> he's like oh, well, we kind of pared it down to an even smaller. <laughs> you didn't make the final cut. Yeah. <laughs> And and again, the way it was described was oh God. they so wanted funny. they wanted an even more exclusive. Now they wouldn't describe it that way. That's not how they sure. worded it. But there was an attitude of of a tier level. Yeah, you know, there 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 were certain people who were allowed at the upper tier. If you made it to seven a.m. in the morning to yeah. the final tier, so one of the, one of the funny things is there were several years where. I had a roommate who was not only in this world, but was fairly near the top of the of the food chain yeah. in this in this world. And as a result, uh, same thing, you know, he would invite me out to all these exclusive things and stuff. Um, and again, I totally, uh, I, I need to apologize to him next time I see him because I underappreciated it. But uh, but because he lived with me, our basement had like this little area set up where he had turntables and we had like my computer for audio and stuff like that. And we had painted it special ways and all these things. So the after, 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 after party always would, or very frequently would end up there. But I was obviously auto included because that's where I fucking live, you know? So, it, but I, again, I, I never quite appreciated it. Because well, <laughs> and another element as to why, and we've talked about this before, correct me if I'm wrong, that you and I didn't really appreciate it is as musician musicians, people who write, mu you and I write music, yeah. we play a, a lot of, we both play piano and guitar and bass and keyboard right. and kazoo and tambourine. Kazoo. <laughs> and we love music. And when we look at DJs, we're like, well, you're just playing other people's music. That's, right. You're not. There's a little bit of snobbery on our side. <laughs> yeah, which I think is partly justified and partly not right because it's we, a different kind of thing it's because we would skill. watch these djs playing other people's music and they would have crowds of thousands of people yeah yeah and, and it's I'd stuff like, that what? i can't do like i can't pick 10 songs in a row that will have a thousand people jumping Certainly. out of their chairs yeah it's it's a job yeah. and 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 again it's just a different art form that yeah. pe people get into but the we, you and I were always just kind of boggled by the whole process. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. You know, because because <laughs> that was their primary, <laughs> their their highest. Like they would go to a rock show, these guys. Yeah, and they'd be like, eh. But then they'd go to like a famous DJ. They'd be like, dude, so and so's DJing at the Trinity, right. and like we'd go like, oh, and okay. they would lose their shit, like and we, for and, real. And uh, you and I'd be standing in the audience, going, he's just like every other. Fucking <laughs> well, so when I was in my basement in those after after afters, right? Uh, my friend would be DJing, and all of a sudden he'd drop in the next thing, and several of the people there would be like, "Oh my god, that's sick!" And they would like look at me and like, "Can you believe it?" And I'd be like, "Yeah," and I had would have no <laughs> clue why that one was sick, but the previous one wasn't. Sick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I you know the fire festival. As I'm watching the documentaries and the interviews and the people and the vibe, I'm thinking it's all those kinds of people. Right. It's it's the exact group of people. Although maybe, ironically, they booked bands. Right. Well, maybe that's why we didn't recognize the other ones. Yeah. Because there was definitely a lot of oons music once they got there. You oh, know what I mean? yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, so... Did you call it oons? Oons, 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 That's oons. funny. I've never, I mean, it makes total sense. Yeah. I've just never heard of it. So Billy McFarland starts this credit card and he creates this exclusive world that appeals to a particular group of people 
n- not us, but you right. know, a particular kind of exclusive minded group of people. The, the kind of people that are on the verge of tears when they almost don't get their credit card. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, uh, what's his face? Yep. Um, Patrick Bateman. And so, uh, creates all this buzz. He's making all this money, but soon, uh, people start actually yelping mm-hmm. about this card, right? You know, start, there's a, there's public reviews, right? And also actual Yelp reviews and all of this buzz starts to fall apart because people, it's not good <laughs> because people are like, one, these deals aren't very good. The, right. the deals we were promised aren't very good. The clubhouse isn't very good. The, the benefits are being sold to us in such a way that it doesn't, it's not delivering. Yeah. Like at that point in his quote unquote career, it wasn't yet like out and out just freaking fraud, but it certainly wasn't on the up and up. It wasn't like what you see is what you get. Well, so this is the, this is the crossroads where we see who he really is. Yeah. A non-narcissistic, non-psychopathic person because I'm because my hypothesis, oh yeah, I given I <laughs> given his full story here is that he fits the he fits the profile of a con artist. Did you see the Hulu one by the way? No, they they show they interview him, and they show interviews. I'll talk about it in a bit, but it's so <laughs> so you know skipping forward in terms of our talk here is that he has this this quality where he likes to trick people out of their money. Uh, and I've seen this before, you know, there's a certain quality of person. It's, it's essentially psychopathy. Now it's low grade psychopathy because yeah. he's not like Charles Manson. He's not a sadistic psychopath. He's not, you know, he's not trying right. to kill people. He doesn't like to cut up animals or anything. He likes, he, he gets off. He's almost obsessed. You could say with trying to trick people out of their money. Yep. And now, but with this first credit card, we don't know that yet. No. Because he's, he's young. Maybe he made a mistake. He bit off more than he could chew. We don't really know. A non-narcissistic, non-psychopathic person, because I'm not, I'm not diagnosing him, by the way. I'm, I'm just pointing out, like, the data we have yeah. available to us on the internet uh, lends itself to this hypothesis, but there's no way for me to know unless I actually talk to him, but to demonstrate the condition as yeah, to yeah. what we can see on the internet. Um, so another person who wasn't on, on these spectrums would, Spectra, would say, hmm, okay, I learned my, I've learned from my mistake. The next time I try to launch something. I won't stretch myself so thin and yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I'll totally. try to make sure that I deliver. Right. Which is possible. People do that yeah. all the time. Amazon.com. Learn from your mistakes. It's Microsoft. Totally great. Yeah. Google. They all made claims and probably yeah. realized, ooh, we stretched ourselves. We went too far. Totally. Pull back. You know, there's ways to make billions of dollars. It's not like you have to con people. No. Uh, smart entrepreneurs understand that. Right. You know, but, and, you know, uh, uh, reputation, especially the kind of reputation he was building since it was so public. Right. Is everything in yeah. business. And he, I mean, the thing is, like, he had many ingredients of, doing great things, right? Like he had great ideas or at least what seemingly like viable ideas that most people don't come up with and great connections, great hustle (laughs) in some way, right? And, but... (laughs) I also hypothesize that he's of maybe average IQ because he's so quickly burnt himself out. So, I mean, because... Yeah. a, A more intelligent you know, minor psychopath con artist would have figured out a way to sustain your ability to con people. Yeah. He so quickly burnt himself out. Right. And, and, and in such a glorious, like self-defeating right. way. Yeah. Right. Like, cause you know, once the fire festival happens, you're just like, my God, what a bunch of dumb choices. Right. Like, totally. Just so dumb. There, and then what so, followed, it was even yeah. like, yeah, totally. So then the, so he has to shut down the, the credit card. And soon after that, in um, like 2016, 2015, he starts the fire festival. Yeah. So first he started the fire app. The fire app, right. Which by the way, when I heard it described, I'm like, hey, that sounds like a good idea. Me too. Right? I, I was like, oh my God. An app that lets you uh, essentially book 
talent, like famous talent, like huge famous talent for your event. How else do you get in contact? The story they tell is is like, hey, I was trying to get in contact with Jarul, and I'm like, I don't know. And I asked my buddy and I had to pay him money. And then he got me someone else that I paid more money. And then I like finally got in contact with Jarul. I'm like, this shouldn't be so hard. Like, that's a good idea. Right. Sounds like a good idea. Not only famous talent, but unfamous yeah. talent. So if you're a singer and you can sing you know, Elton John songs right. or your Ja Rule and you can charge $100,000 for a appearance or something, they called it the Uber for hiring right. a talent, which I was like, my God. Sounds that, great. It's a great idea. Um, and I wish that it existed. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so they started that app and it, you know, was beginning. It never really took off, but it was getting going. And then they wanted to start the fire festival, uh, which would be a, a music festival. So it's interesting is, do you know why they went from the Uber of talent, which is a great idea. Yeah. And actually has pretty low risk because yep. you just have they to- They don't have to defraud anyone for that. Right. You just have to invest in the infrastructure right. and the tech people and the marketing. Right. You, there's, it's low risk in terms of like losing your shirt. I mean, you definitely could, but it's low risk. Yeah. And plus it's a good idea. It probably would have worked right. on right, some right. level, especially if you took, you know, 5% of every fee, you know? Right. How did they go from that to a music festival? Well, so for one thing, even before the music festival came about, he was already lying his ass off because he was, they were lying about who was they, I don't know who they is, but at least he was lying about who was already signed on to be part of the app, like celebrities and things like that. They were lying about how much money they had raised. They were lying about who the investors were, all these kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, right? so, so let me highlight that again <clears throat> in terms of like our conceptualization of a psychopathic con artist. And psychopathic meaning that he lacks empathy, he gets off somewhat on criminal activity and, um, and harming other people, doesn't mind lying to people, doesn't feel the same guilt or remorse about... And risk is not... doesn't affect them. And dangerous behavior. And again, of average IQ, because if... It's so easy to double check whether or not the person you have claimed is on your yeah. uh, on your app. You know, if you're like, uh, you know, uh, Jay Z has signed up on Fire <laughs> App, all you right. have to do is look at the app and right. find out if that's true. One or tweet uh, Jay Z, and Jay Z's like, no, no, like that's a dumb choice. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like he must be, he must not be very bright. And so right, and so because that's happening. I think uh, that plus, you know, the, the idea itself of like, how do we promote this? Um, I think a little light bulb went inside his head, which was, yeah, I need to make a lot of money very quickly so I can make. So if I have this, you know, big shows, they can generate tons of money. Right. And I think that plus Ja Rule being like, yeah, dude, we could do this in an island and all these things like that created a little snowball. Right. But it was really meant to be a promote, like on the surface, it was like, oh, a promotion for our app effort. But I think inside his head, he was like, I need a lot of money and I need it fast. <laughs> and it's so, again, of average intelligence, because the notion that you're going to be able to create a huge music festival involving thousands of people. In like, what, eight months? In, on an, a small island in the middle of the Caribbean. I mean, it's hard enough to create a music festival in a, in a city. Right. Let alone in the middle of the Caribbean. Oh, and not ever having done it. Not even, right. not even having done like a little one. <laughs> right. No one right. in his organization had done this before. <laughs> yeah. Not even, like you said, a little one. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, they'd done events for that credit sure. card, like, sure. at a, like maybe at a club or yeah. something. But anyway. But not a festival. <laughs> right. So, but you could see a young average intelligence person with Jaw Rule's uh, uh, endorsement being like, yeah, we could pull this off. We'll sell tickets and we'll hire the vendors. You know, it'll work out. You totally. Know? Um, so they start this fire festival and it's supposed to take place in the spring of 2017, reportedly at Pablo Escobar's private island. Uh, which uh, it ended up getting moved around to a bunch of islands. And, and I don't know if they covered this in, in, in the Netflix. I can't remember which one it was, but it, 
it's incredible to go to your point about like how dumb are you how, how are you able to get this much money from people and have these great ideas and yet be so dumb at the same time because they they have an agreement with the the whoever the owners are of that pablo escobar island that potentially they're interested in this thing so they're working out the deal terms but they say whatever you do you cannot use pablo escobar at all you cannot mention that because we're trying to change this island from being that all these things in the ad big bold letters pablo escobar's island immediately what do they do they're like they pull out right. like how dumb are you right yeah just dumb yeah that's like not a good move right you, you were told explicitly right and it's on the internet yeah. And of course, the owners or the, you know, the people interested yeah. in it are going to check out your website. Of course. Yeah. It's just, it's just so dumb. And that's just one of literal thousands of right. decisions that you can just be like, boy, was that dumb. And, cause, and you know, you could say like, well, we tried to hide it. It didn't say Paulus. I said like, you know, uh, an island once used as drug running or something. Yeah, yeah. And then we didn't realize that would be the reason for you guys pulling out. No. Yeah. Well, you told us no one on the name. We used the name. <laughs> yeah. Conversely, though, he knows enough about how the internet works and how to create buzz that he knew that if he said Pablo Escobar's island, yeah. that would be a huge bump. I just, I, I agree with that, but I don't think that he had like the chess move plan. Like I'm going to sacrifice the queen because I get the, the king. Right. Clearly, because when you look at the whole story. Because it's not like they had a backup island. Right. <laughs> and when you, again, when you look at all the little right. decisions he made, it's right. just like, wow. It, it was like, like just as a, for instance, you know, this is skipping forward in the story, but he purposely made this event a social media event in that the marketing was social media, but also he wanted the, he wanted the guests to be very interested Influencers, in yeah. social media. Um, and yet when people landed on the island, there were instantly memeable things to tweet, yeah, a, to right, tweet about right. that were so obviously, uh, you know, made the event look horrible. Right. You know what I mean? Well, because they, they, they would have obviously... They should have obviously known that given the incredible publicity they set up for the thing and that they were bringing a whole bunch of people who make their life out of pub publishing. And all the, <laughs> the people who are attracted to it, just the regular, right, just the regular right. guests are of the sort that know how to use and right. probably have a, lot of, have a relative amount of followers. You also, know. talk about like everyone who paid for this thing had to be very wealthy. Right. Talk about pissing off a whole bunch of very wealthy people yeah. that can have lawyers ready. Yeah. Yeah. So again, going back to Billy's personality, is it narcissism? Hard to say. Seems like it. Is it psychopathic uh, con artist syndrome? Seem hard to say. Seems like it. Is it average IQ? Hard to say. Or is it some kind of complex? You know, there's a lot of other complexes that can lead to this that I wouldn't conceptualize as the previous ones. There are some people who just have a desperate need for attention and for acceptance. Sure. And uh, will self-sabotage in the process based mm -hmm. on their own lives and don't necessarily have to have a personality disorder to do that. But uh, so it'd be hard to say like what I would come up with, but it's, I'm leaning towards the psychopathic, narcissistic con artist with an average IQ. So, so, okay. So at this point in the, in the documentary, the, uh, the first one I watched was the Netflix one. Before I watched the documentary, I knew very little. I knew that this had happened. I knew that it had been a disaster. I didn't really know much more than that. So but at this point in the documentary, when they start showing the planning for the island and stuff like that, I was still thinking in my mind how sort of like how tragic this was. I was feeling bad for Billy. I'm like, ah, man, it seems like he had a great idea and like must have made a, a series of wrong turns. But then something started happening that went because they were showing a ton of footage of them, right? Uh, because by the way, the documentary was partly put together by the Jerry ad agency that was the the marketing team, mm. so they of course had a lot of footage, right? But I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I start realizing something. As the stress starts mounting, he appears cool as a cucumber, right? Yeah, and uh, starts to avoid. Yeah, like he 
doesn't know what to do as the stress right. starts to mount. He doesn't, he starts, to, and he starts to resort, which we'll get into to some psychopathic things, you yeah. know? So, but before the event there, well, let's take a break. What do you say, bro? Let's do it. So, Berto, if we created a festival to uh, entice patrons to come, how would we do that? Well, first of all, it'd be called the Le Meteor. Everything I, I create is going to be Le something. Okay. And it's like the meteor. Okay. And it's going to be... You're going to have Le Music at the... Le Music, yeah. And it's going to be hosted in the heart of the Congo. Uh, people will be... By Leroy Jenkins. Sure. People will be choppered in from the you know they have to go to africa somewhere and then we'll chopper them in mm -hmm. and uh it will be held in a tree canopy you know like we'll, we'll build this whole thing up in the, the trees mm. and the the and everyone, acts, everyone will get uh, their own personal monkey absolutely uh and a bodyguard like a gorilla bodyguard so yeah. a gorilla bodyguard and a monkey like uh butler and a cheetah friend oh i like it yeah and so so yeah. we'll offer this as a package if you become a patron, you'll get this. Yeah, guaranteed. For free. For free. Just sign up on patreon.com and you'll get the special Le Meteor Music <laughs> Gorilla Festival. <laughs> so the marketing for Fire Festival was interesting. As I'm watching the, the documentary, I was both uh, amazed at how well it was put together. Yeah. But also just completely creeped out by by the uh techniques you know because mm. they hired all these models you know right and paid thousands of dollars like like maybe millions of dollars just to hire like a few like right. i don't know a, a dozen models top to, models yeah. yeah and and it's and it's billy uh what's his face ja rule. and ja rule and like some other who has yeah. and these you know these these supermodels yeah and they're in the beach and they're on a yacht and they're around a campfire and they're drinking and they're dancing. And I'm just thinking like, it's, you know, there's commercials and then there's this. Right. You know, it's just so <laughs> blatantly cheesy. I, I don't know the word for it. Like, um, I, I don't know any other word other than creepy. Like Creepy is right, man, because it's like, it is, it's, promising something so blatantly impossible right right but but pretending like it's not it's like but it, it, come on like you've hired these famous models and you're appealing to a certain demographic yeah the you know kind of wealthy person that feels like oh i want to go be in that thing right right uh oh and by the way remember those scenes where like ja rule is trying to get Oh, yeah. One of the models in the water or something. She's it's like, like, she's like, no, uh, I don't want to do that. You yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. Icky. And they even say, they even say, uh, Billy says, no, you, you don't get it. Like we're trying to show the loser. Like, I think he, 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 I don't know if he uses the word loser, but it's like, you know, the lonely guy that sees this, they could be here. They, so if you guys are coming out of the water for us, that's like the, the fantasy. Right. So they, they're trying to appeal to that. Yeah. Very, it's very blatant. Yeah. I mean, it's almost cynical marketing. You yeah. know, it's like, how do you see humans? But right. it worked, man. Right. Like right. the totally. buzz, the, you know, they had nothing to offer at this right. point. They don't really have a festival yet. They have some people kind of signed right. up. They, but they don't have. I mean, that ad is as high level as you can get right they don't have the infrastructure <laughs> in fact they don't even have the island yet like they're no nope. at this point they're like three islands away from the eventual island that they're going to do yeah. it on uh, they pay kendall jenner a quarter of a million dollars to make one post oh my god can you imagine <laughs> one post quarter of a million so I know someone like this, actually. I, I know, you know, at a much lower level, but in that direction. Where, <laughs> An influencer? Yeah, where she gets paid to make one post or to make a oh series of God. posts. Like, people will hire her to do this kind of thing. And, and um, you know, it makes sense on a, on a marketing level. Because they have level. followers, and that yeah. costs a certain amount of money. Right. And uh, it's just interesting. It's interesting, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, like, we don't think anything of 
paying millions of dollars for a commercial during the Super Bowl. Right. And it's, it's but no thing. one. What well, I guess what's what's unfortunate is that the target demographic that is in fact influenced by that post from Kendall Jenner or whoever it is, they're not aware or taught at any point in in their life, or at least not when they're young. Wh- why to guard themselves against stuff like that? Like we were never, I was never taught how to think about advertisements. Right. Right. So we'll get into the lessons later, but I think one of the lessons here is how easy it is for us to be tricked by marketing. And I think one of the problems is that we're uh, emerging out of is that, you know, Twitter and these social media influencers are new. We didn't have them 10 years ago. And so, you know, someone watches a TV commercial today and that most people have at least some ability to be like, eh, it's a commercial, it's a corporation, you know, right. take it with a grain of salt. But with these influencers, we don't have that notion really in our society yet, mostly, be, mostly because it's new, but, but also because the main people who are paying attention to these influencers are younger people. That's true, yeah. And are more susceptible to it, you know? I don't know. Well, it's like Saturday morning cartoon commercials. Right. How how often didn't we say, I want Frosted Lucky Charms. Right. I want that Star Wars toy. Yeah. We are very susceptible as little kids and young people. The difference is when we're seven, we can't afford or buy or have control. (laughs) But when you're 25 and you have a trust fund, right? Blah blah blah. So 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 they're doing all this stuff. Half quarter million, Kendall Jenner, and, and that's just you know a portion of the millions of dollars that they paid all these people. You know they had the top models of the world. They had Emily Ratajkowski, who was in the Blurred Lines video and the Ben Affleck movie, uh, Gone Girl and uh, Bella Hadid and, you know, the biggest young right. models of the day. Uh, they were sp- sparing no expense. And to be honest, they at the time called me and asked my opinion. And I told them, I'm like, no, girl, don't do it. It's going to, you know, but they didn't listen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they, they, they promised free deluxe accommodations to quote unquote influencers. Um, they paid millions of dollars for the music acts. Uh, yeah, just massive success. And by I mean, the way, they didn't pay. They didn't pay, but they promised them. They right? promised to pay. Yeah. yeah. Um, just a huge marketing success. Like, if one thing they did well was how to work social media. Totally. Yeah. Um, so, uh, like, that's, see, that just accentuates the tragedy of this thing that they could have actually pulled something off yeah. and been incredibly successful right. that didn't have to be so ridiculous. Right. All What they needed was to give themselves maybe another six months, one. They also needed someone to be in charge that's sort of independent of Billy yeah. who has done this 20 other times. Yep. And they didn't have that person. Well, and the one red flag would have been, oh, no one has ever done this. <laughs> right, right. You can't hire that person. Right. The closest is you can hire someone that has thrown massive festivals, reading, whatever it is. Right. And yeah, it's going to be expensive, but at least they're going to be able to call bullshit when it's bullshit. So one of the tragedies of that effect was that many of the vendors who had done this for other events before immediately saw that Billy McFarlane had no idea what he was doing. That's right. They were like, this looks like it's going to be a disaster. Yeah. The, you know, the, what are, what's happening, but they were, they getting, still got involved, but, but they were getting paid too. I know. And I, I honestly, I, when I watched that documentary, uh, I had, a, I don't, didn't have a ton of sympathy for not all of them, but several of the ones that, and the reason is because they were saying, What you're saying is like, ah, man, I thought, I thought this didn't make sense. But you know, then I, especially that, that one guy that was sort of like his, the older dude that he had worked with, man, I mean, his story was pretty sad, but at the same time, I'm like, you knew, you knew and you enabled him to pull this off. Yeah. To try to pull this off. One, I think because they're sort of rewriting history. I'm guessing if you would have asked them at the, at the time, they would have thought like, well, it might work, but it might Mm. not. 
Could they look be. back. They look back now, and they're like, "Well, of course, I knew it wasn't going to well, work." Well, but so, right, but some of those meetings they describe later in the pro, like towards the latter part of the process, sound like absolutely many of them knew that they should absolutely pull the plug, and they still kept going. Right. So some people were actually being paid, yeah. during that process because Billy was actually getting millions of dollars from investors. Right, which is amazing. Yeah, he can go to New York, grab a whole bunch of money from someone. Yeah, and would be paying some of the vendors right away. But the tragedy is the the people of the island didn't get paid. No. He hired there were hundreds. Well, so I couldn't really tell from exactly what the figures were, but it sounded like the island only had like a couple hundred people who lived on it. Yeah. And reportedly he hired pretty much like every, all of them. Yeah. Every available adult. <laughs> right. And none of them or very few of them got any pay. He promised them, you know, tons right. of money and blah, blah, blah. And they did all this work and, made, and probably even invested money into their own, you know, activities. And they're all screwed. Now, of yeah. course, you know, there's a lot of lawsuits. But anyway, so the festival, there, there were reports of tickets as low as like $500 and as high as quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. You know, so you could get kind of, it was, <laughs> and it was all based on your the things you could get while you're on the yeah. air, like the the how good your accommodations were. Uh, it, it, but the thing was, was that even at the $500 level, which is the cheapest or, you know, around there, the accommodations were still glorious. Right. You know, it, it just, it start the low end accommodations were these beautiful bungalows. Right. And, and it just went up from there. Well, and to, to the conversation earlier about the, after party exclusivity and the VIP, the VIP, the VIP. It had that that effect of it of like, sure, go ahead, pay your little five hundred bucks. Or right, and then if you're really something something special, you could really get something special. Right. So to someone who is in that world, that exclusive VIP EDM world, you are thinking, man, this is like the exclusive of all exclusive. Yeah. They they're only selling five thousand tickets. Yeah, you know, like a a big like Coachella, there'll be hundreds of thousands of yeah. people. So not only is it exclusive in that way, but it's also exclusive in that it's on an island. Yeah, like you're not just you're not in the middle of Ohio or California. You're in an island that is exclusive to begin with. And the event's gonna make history, and I'll be there. Right, and there's all these models, and there's beautiful water, and da da da, um, and it sold out right away. Yeah. Five thousand tickets. Yeah. Just a, a boon of marketing. People signing on the dotted line, sending thousands and thousands of dollars. Take my money. Sight unseen. Yeah. You know, I'm ready to go. People, like, it's just, a, in, again, the marketing success of this. Crazy. Because, um, for example, the Upstream Festival in, in Seattle, uh, they're trying to start, you know, they're trying to start kind of like a North by Northwest uh or South by Southwest, sorry, uh, like in Austin. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it would make sense that Seattle would have a South by Southwest. Why not call it North by Northwest? That's, uh, that's true. I mean, what the heck? And Who do I need to talk to? <laughs> and it's backed, I believe, by Amazon. So you have this backing of all this money. What's it called? Upstream? Upstream. What the hell? And they they had like a tech component. It's you know, It was also like a CES in Vegas. Uh, okay. And... Uh, if for whatever reason it just it just didn't take off, and I just got an email today saying they're they're not going to do it again. Next I year. know why. Why it wasn't called North by Northwest, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, it's um, you know it's just hard to do these kinds of things. It's so there there are legitimate organizations that are that have legitimate marketing and legitimate yeah. blah blah blah, and can't get enough people to come these guys come along and sell out the, the situation, <laughs> right. you know? Right. It's like, this is like the, it makes everyone else feel stupid and left out. And so when you, again, when you look at the people, they look like their average age is like 23 or something. Yeah. And all white kids. And I'm just like, or mostly anyway. And I'm thinking, how in the hell are these kids affording this? I mean, I know right. there are a lot of rich kids in the United States. Right. But, that many rich kids? Yeah. You know, it's an interesting phenomenon because when I grew up, uh, you know, when I was in my 20s, I couldn't afford to go to concerts. Right. You know, 20, 30. And, and we're talking about like $80 concerts. $20 tickets. $20 concerts, yeah. I'd be like, 
I no, I can't right. afford that. A five dollar cover charge to get yeah, into a right. car. I'd be like, oh, I guess I'm not going. <laughs> um, or I would sneak in the back door to avoid sure. it. Um, and to me, it's very weird. I, I have a local uh, observation. So Bumbershoot, Bumbershoot yeah. is our local music, uh, arts, comedy festival that's held right underneath the Space Needle at Seattle Center. And, you know, you'll have, uh, I love it. They have, you know, like Blondie played. And, yeah. Uh, uh, um, I, was, I was sad I missed that, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Blondie, I was sad about. They would also have like young EDM people mm -hmm. and, and they have stand-up comics and they have art and they have like hula hooping and juggling yeah. and uh, how to do a, uh, a sculpting. Like they had a, like Oh, a, really? Yeah. And they had like video shorts and... And uh, by cheerleaders way, doing doing pyramids. And uh, we're we're talking about Seattle, by the way. So hey, we've made, given justice to the to our psychology in Seattle name. That's true. <laughs> oh, by the way, I don't. Yeah, so I was on another podcast recently, and the guys while we were talking, they're like, "Oh, I get it." You're called psychology in Seattle. It's like sleepless in Seattle. <laughs> Has, has that ever had that ever of occurred course. to you? Yeah. Oh, it did. Yeah, yeah. Did had that occurred to me? I don't know. It and never, we never like made it explicit, but I just I just figured it was part of the whole thing. No. Okay. Why would I name my <laughs> podcast? Well, I didn't think you named it because of that. I just felt it was like a layered thing. It's no. It's psychology in Seattle because we live in Seattle. Psychology in Seattle because Seattle was cooler back then. And psychology in Seattle, sleepless in Seattle, you know, things in Seattle. It made sense. As soon as I heard that, I wanted to change the name of the podcast. Really? <laughs> yeah. That, that's... Sleepless in Seattle was huge. To everyone outside of Seattle. Yeah. It's the only thing they know about Seattle. Exactly. It's like calling well, that my in <laughs> It's like calling my. It's like you know, whenever everyone are for. Oh, you're from Seattle. It rains there all the time. I'm it, like, look, uh, you guys can't see this at home, but tell our viewers what you're wearing right now. A flannel. A flannel. So don't get on your high horse, mighty. Like sleepless in Seattle is huge. Look, I'm just saying, flannel has nothing to do with sleepless in Seattle. By the well, way, well, I'm just saying flannel is a Seattle thing. Yeah. So. It's just funny how that just never occurred to me, and it bothers. And it, if you listeners out there th thought, please email me that if you thought this was true, I just have to say, like, <laughs> I am sorry for coming across like a dumbass who would <laughs> who would name his podcast after such a stupid thing. Oh my god, I'm gonna change because, history. Because, because okay, so wh whatever <laughs> town you're from, New York uh, City, L.A., Tucson, Dallas. Uh, you know, Minneapolis, London, think about the kinds of dumbass things you hear from people who don't know your town. Okay. And identify something, you know, like, so, like, oh, you're from London. Oh, uh, put some shrimp on the Barbie. You know, like when people don't understand your, your I know that's Australian, <laughs> but like, you know, or for that, you know, oh, you're Australian. Uh, that's not a knife. This is a knife. Like <laughs> there are certain things you hear over and over and over again as like basically the only thing that outsiders know about your city, you become extremely wary of those memes. Well, sure. And so I, as someone who's born and raised, <laughs> I've lived in Seattle for 48 years now. There are so many things about Seattle that I associate all the neighborhoods. Every, I have associations with particular, you know, uh, intersections right from in that seattle. movie sleepless in seattle <laughs> and there you know you, you you hear rain sleepless in seattle you hear about the battle of seattle sometimes wto you hear about uh maybe bill gates kurt cobain um uh, you know i guess grunge singles i don't think that's popular enough that's true uh but listen if you and, or frazier for example like people will be like oh my god you're a therapist you are the frazier and i'm like that's okay. One that wasn't filmed in Seattle. They just put a bat. <laughs> they acted like it was filmed in Seattle. That's good enough, man. And when they're going to that coffee shop, that didn't look like a Seattle coffee shop. Anyway, my well, point but, is, but, is but, that well, uh, I'm sorry that anyone thought that I did but that. But imagine we did a podcast about food and we were from Arizona. We'd probably call it Tasting Arizona. And if someone's like, oh, I get it, like, you know, like that movie, and like, yeah, sort of. Ugh. So anyway, Bumbershoot, 
which is another word for umbrella, which yeah. is, you know, of course, playing into the stereotype. Sleepless in Seattle. That, I mean, that Seattle rain. is rainy all the time. Um, a, uh, all the kids who, so at Bumbershoot, when I go to Bumbershoot, the tickets are like 140 bucks a day. Wait, what? Yeah. That's expensive. Yeah. Holy crap. So to go to one day of Bumbershoot uh-huh. and see like, you know, bands and other things from noon to right. 11 at night, 140 bucks. Jeez. Um, I consider it worth it because the acts are so great and there's so few people that you can get into everything you want to go to. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it's, they don't sell that many tickets so that like you can go right up to the front at the Blondie concert. You know wow. what I mean? Like it's, it's not <laughs> like you're in Key Arena or something, right. you know, like there's so few people that you get to do everything you want and there's, there's no waiting and blah, blah. Anyway. So, <laughs> so now I'm 48. I have a career. I can afford $140 right. ticket, but the vast majority of the customers at Bumbershoot, <laughs> I like, I've noticed it over the years cause it's gotten more prominent. I, it's <laughs> like every once in a while, I just kind of do like a, like a head count. Uh huh. I'm not even joking. 80% of the people who are there, maybe more, look to be 18-year-old girls. What? Maybe 20-year-olds. Did they save for months to go? <laughs> right. I, and, and they're, and they're in, usually in big groups. And there is a lot of money accumulating in Seattle, though. Yeah. But still, yeah. Like, like, if I had $140 when I was 18, <laughs> yeah. there are so many other things I would have spent it on. Well, case in point, when I was... Well, I guess I was 17 or something, but I was scraping to, to um, I, there was this keyboard I wanted to buy that was 500 bucks. Right. So I was trying to save 250 because my mom was going to pitch in 250. Right. Right. <laughs> so imagine spending half of that on one day right. at Seattle Center. Like, so it sort of boggles oh the God. mind. Like, and, and so either, so a number of things are possible. Like everyone has a ton of money, enough to go to the fire festival. There's, a, there's just enough yeah. wealth in our country that you know the upper five thousand people can spend upper one yeah. percent you know and seattle has a lot of rich people now right um or uh parents are giving their kids a lot more spending cash yeah you know like ev- even parents who really can't afford it are like just shelling out a right. lot more money to their kids because that's that was the other thing like when i was growing up even though my parents could have given me money they didn't give me money. They're just like, we have better things to do with this money. Right. Like, I, I'm not going to endorse you spending <laughs> yeah. like $50 on a on a concert ticket because I think that's a waste of money. Right. You know, uh, you should be saving that money for something. So uh, there's also, there were, there were stories of people that had sold like all their stuff so they could go. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's another thing, right? It's like, yeah. so even non-rich people. Right. That's just interesting. Anyway. So um, there were all these different packages, like the yacht package, and there was a Kendall Jenner party package that they were selling. And again, now we're getting into the con artist thing. Right. Oh, Kendall Jenner will be there. Because she wasn't going to be there or something like that. Um, (laughs) Well, and they even, like, they were really vague because people started assuming that Kanye was going to play there. Oh, really? Because Kendall Jenner had made the post. Yeah. And, like, they never were clear about that, or at least at first they weren't, so... So there were all these other kinds of uh, con artist things that Billy was doing, like when they finally did decide which island they were going to do, it's called Exuma Island, and they took an aerial photo of it and photoshopped it to make it look like it was a deserted island. Yeah. Because they, they, it's a there's a town on that island. I'm not even sure they took a photo or just used the Sandals resort photo. Yeah, they, they yeah. took a photo. Yeah. And then they photoshopped out right. uh, like 90% of the island. Yeah, they made it look like it was like its own little thing. Right. So again, dumb. Because yeah. once people arrive, right. they're going to go, wait. Right. And, and it's not, and pl- plus go to Google Earth. Right. You know, you'll so, see it's, it does, there's a discrepancy. Or go to the resort website, right. you'll see a discrepancy. It's just it, a dumb choice. So that was one thing that really puzzled me. Yeah, you know that, that lawyer... Uh, I don't know what his role was. There was that guy they interviewed who was apparently a super powerful lawyer or something that had a lot of connections with the artists and all these things. And he was the one that started the Facebook group trying to denounce the Fire Festival. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, like that guy, talk about someone who's connected. Like, I want that guy on my team, you know? But, uh, and seemed really smart. But the, here's the thing. He starts this thing, puts a whole bunch of, of evidence 
and it didn't seem to make a dent. Right. Right. Like no one listened or cared. Right. So this is, we'll get into this a little bit later, is evidence of a mass delusion. Yeah. Which we'll get into as well. Um, there's, they don't have any festival insurance. Oh my God. Uh, which is a dumb choice. Yeah. There was, as you said, talk about pulling the plug uh, as, as the you know, problems were mounting. But Billy said, no, as you said. Yeah. He's just like, no, we're forging ahead. Yeah. So either he's extremely good at denial, which is, so that's another complex that he could suffer from, that it's not narcissism or psychopathic con artist syndrome. It's that he just, maybe he was so abused growing up that there's certain parts of his brain when something doesn't compute that he just turns off that part of his awareness. Yeah. Because some people are like that. Could be. Like, this, there's many scenes, like, uh, we're getting a little ahead of it, but like, the, you know the scene where he's standing up on the table giving his... There's the scenes later where they show him coming out of the courtroom, all these things. Where I'm thinking, you know, uh, again, quote unquote, more average person or something would just be under so much stress. Yeah, I mean, to me, if if I was in that situation, I would pay the last little bit of money I had for a plane to like Jamaica and I'd never never be seen again. And I'd grow my hair long <laughs> and get a big tan and I would like change my name to King Lion or Dude, let's do that. That sounds amazing. <laughs> and I would just be like this is my life now. What if we podcast it from Jamaica? <laughs> I think about that sometimes. I mean, not Jamaica, but like, like for let's let's because uh, we can podcast from anywhere. For you patrons out there, like listen and go recruit ten of your friends and stuff. Like listen, you can make this a reality. We could be podcasting from. Do you care where we podcast from? Just because it's called psychology in Jamaica, hey, buy the Ken, <laughs> buy the Kendall Jenner package on Patreon. And even better, uh, you may not have heard of this, but w there's a new movie coming out. It's Tom Hanks and uh, Meg Ryan. It's called uh, Awake in Jamaica, and it's going to be all around our podcast, and they're going to be coming on the show. It's great. It'll be raining all the time. <laughs> There'll be lots of flannel. Kurt Cobain will be there. Um, so this is what you're referring to earlier. So there's this older gentleman, a gay gentleman, uh, that was his right. associate in business. His name's Andy. And at some point, one of the vendors is like, look, unless you give me money, I'm not going to, I hear bad things about your event. I can't supply you with this supply because I don't see money. Yeah. I, I need to be paid first because I'm worried I'm going to get screwed in this transaction. Yeah. And so Billy, in his psychopathic con artist uh, vein here, goes to his friend and associate Andy and says, look, dude everything's going to fall apart if we don't get these supplies. So I need you to go to the supplier and I need you to suck his dick Yeah, and convince him to give us the supplies. Right. Which, is, I mean, just think about that. Yeah. Prostitution. You're asking your <laughs> oh friend and colleague to become a sex worker. And again, you're not telling anyone to not say anything. Right. You know, you don't you don't have any recourse if the guy turns around and tweets that you just asked or him to do talks that. about it on a documentary, <laughs> right? You're just you're just this is dumb choices. And then he almost did it. And the guy prepares, you know, he's because he's like, man, if it all comes down to me, you know, I, I guess yeah. I guess I have to do it. And at the, at the last minute, he goes over, you know, to the guy, yeah. and the guy's like, don't worry about it. I'll I'll give you. It was water. So the uh, supplier, I think it was the customs guy, wasn't it? No, no. Well, it's the customs guy to release the water. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. But but here's the thing. That's the guy, Andy, that I, I didn't actually end up having so much sympathy for because I felt like, I, I, look, I'm not saying he wasn't extremely manipulated by Billy and like, God, what a position to put a friend in. But he knew and he could have backed out and he didn't. Yeah. I mean, he could have, again, I think this is where the mass delusion comes in. Yeah. Which we'll get into there. So the event has all sorts of problems. People have trouble actually getting there just on the air in the, in the, that's the, the first sign is like the, the airplanes aren't, are totally delayed just taking off from Miami. Cause well, I think, it, yeah, people landed in Miami and then they were supposed to take a special charter and the quote unquote charter plane was just like a regular plane. It's a 737 or something. Well, like one of those smaller. Yeah. Yeah. And the people in the flight were like, uh, this is the exclusive private jet. Right. So right away people are like, 
wait a second. What's going on? They they get there. There's they can't get their luggage, so they you know they just have you know their carry on. They 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 get on a bus, this janky bus that yeah. that takes them through like the bad part. It's of like town. a school bus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're, you know, they're expecting this beautiful model ridden, you know, oasis. Jungle and, paradise. And it's just this <laughs> crappy island in the, in the Caribbean, a normal island. Yeah. They, they, they immediately see their accommodations and they're these really janky looking tents. Um, not, not just, they are FEMA tents. Right. They're literal FEMA tents. Yeah. Um, there's no food. Half of the people don't even have tents because there's not enough tents for the people. I mean, right there, you know, Billy should have got on a plane and gone to Jamaica and changed his name to, <laughs> so to, to start the day and say, I have five, pe- I have 5,000 people coming, you know, in groups of two or three. And I only have like 500 tents. Yeah. Like the math doesn't work. <laughs> and, and uh, many of the things weren't even put together. There were mattresses everywhere. The, ve- the food vendor places were not set up yet. Like just complete chaos. Yeah. And so people started looting because they wanted to survive. Yeah. Like they, they were like, well, we don't have a mattress in our tent. We don't have enough mattresses. So they would wait for people to leave the other tents and they'd run to the other tents and steal the mattresses. Right. Well, and, and in, in the Hulu document, this was a little bit that wasn't in the Netflix, but in the Hulu one, uh, some of the people there that were working on this, they were actually trying to register everyone and sort of try to bring some process, which is probably impossible. And that's when Billy stands up on a table and starts basically telling people, look, just go find a tent. And that's where like kind of the, the stampede happens. Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> and the artists start to back out right away because yeah. they're getting reports of problems and they're just like, fuck right. it, we're not going to do it. Um, and within just like a couple hours, Everyone wants to get off the island. Yeah, because the con- the thing is done. There's yeah. not going to be any music. Yeah. The accommodations are shit. Everyone's going to catch pneumonia overnight, and there is and no it, food. Or <laughs> it had rained the night before, right? So these tents and the beds are soaking wet. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> they tried to get everyone drunk. Oh uh, yeah, that's the one thing they had, right? They had alcohol. They had a shit ton. They they spent what was it, two and a half million dollars in alcohol? Oh my god. Again, this whole time, Billy is being called upon because he's in charge and he's avoiding or saying a bunch of weird stuff. Again, it's just like, how dumb can right. you be? Oh, and, and to your point of like dumb, like the, the, the taxes on alcohol in that island were so high that they had to pay $900,000 in just the tax. Wow. Yeah. Almost a million dollars just on the tax. Uh, there was no water. Tons of liquor, no water. There were no bathrooms. There were just porta potties. So that that's a big one right there. It's yeah. like so. Imagine you expect this this be- luxury accommodation. Yeah, you've you've paid a quarter of a million dollars for a ticket, and you have a shitty tent with with no mattress in it, and you might not even get that tent because someone might take it, and there's only porta potties. <laughs> there's porta potties, and there's no sinks, <laughs> and, like- there, and there's no water. It's unbelievable. Like there's no, bo- like, you, you know, you, you can't go to a tap and drink the water. There's no tap because they're, yeah. the tents are in this, like this, the beach kind of like a campsite. So it was so. like, and it was actually, they brought in sand because before that it was sort of like gravel. <laughs> yeah. And they didn't have enough sand. So like girls with their sandals were actually bleeding from their feet because oh my God. the rocks were jagging, you know, jabbing. Ouch. In a, um, and then... The famous tweet. Do you know what I'm talking about? The sandwich? Cheese sandwich, yeah. So they start handing out food because people are right. hungry. And they it's just one of those like takeaway uh, styrofoam boxes. Right. Like the cheapest you could you could buy at like, you know, the grocery store or whatever. And there's some like a piece of lettuce and like a half a t- tomato slice, you know, two pieces of Wonder Bread. Just the cheapest bread you could imagine. <laughs> and then two slices of American cheese just kind of slapped on it. <laughs> Unbelievable, man. And that's the, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the food. That's, so on the, on the website, it's, it was hors d'oeuvres. And, and this a famous chef. Uh, yeah. And they, they, <clears throat> they had shots of like, yeah. you know, fancy hors d'oeuvre food and yeah. grills. And they, Which they're better the fuck be for that money. Right. 
And so they get handed this, and this one guy takes a picture of it. He's just a, he's not an influencer. He's just like a regular guy. <laughs> and he, you know, tweets it, and it becomes this hugely famous right. tweet of like, uh, you know, this is, this is my, this is my, this is my meal. fancy meal at the yeah. fire festival. And this is when the, media started blowing up <laughs> about it. It gets immediately canceled, uh, you know, right away. There's a riot and angry mob of the locals who were trying to get paid. Jesus. Um, everyone's talking about it. Conan O'Brien, Fox News, everyone's the talking about it. The meme police is out in full force. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so let's, lo- let's talk about the mass delusion here. So again, when we look at explanations, it's like, is he a psychopathic con artist? Maybe. Seems like there's a lot of evidence there. Meaning that he doesn't have remorse. He lacks empathy. He likes, he actually kind of gets off a little bit on conning people out of their money. He likes to have a little bit of control. He is what they call, you know, uh, superficially charming. Yeah. Because he, he is. When you see interviews with him, oh, yeah? like he's, he comes across as like a, just a kind of the boy next door who you think is going to succeed. Well, you should see again in the Hula one. Because uh, it takes place later. It's before he went to jail, but... Are, is Hulu him. paying you to promote their... <laughs> no. In fact, funny you should say that because the the one on Netflix was by the media company, Jerry Media, that was the part of the cul- culprits in this. In this in, oh. So there's a little bit of a scandal with that. But the flip side is that the Hulu one is way lower quality. Yeah. It's just that they got him... They got interviews with him. Interesting. But, but when you see that one... <clears throat> He ended up after this, he got skinnier, so he looks actually good. Like he, I mean, before he looked fine, but he was like a little overweight and stuff. But after this, he got like fit, and he got a supermodel girlfriend, and, and he was living in a penthouse, like a rich penthouse in New York. So it's like he did better after this disaster until he went to jail. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So is he a psychopathic con artist? Is he a victim of capitalism? Does he have a low IQ? Does he have some sort of denial complex? Does he have some sort of self-sabotage complex? Hard to tell. Um, but, the, but there are some warning signs that he was uh, like the company he, he had, the Fire App company. They were all deluded into thinking they were working on a completely legit thing. And silently behind the scenes, he was already defrauding people left and right. He had already been defrauding people with the ma- with the uh, card thing. Right. He was defrauding everyone that worked with him left and right during the, the thing. He lied about having the island in the first place. He lied about all these things. Lie, 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 lie. Right. And then afterwards. <laughs> right. So a psychopathic con artist, one, is prone to lying and two, doesn't mind lying. Right. Most of us who aren't psychopathic con artists have a really hard time lying, you know? Yeah. Um, one, because we don't want to, and two, because we realize that there's going to be a problem down the road when yep. people realize we're lying, you know? Whereas a psychopathic con artist doesn't, doesn't really mind that. And again, I want to point out, he massively shot himself in the foot multiple times through this entire process. People associate psychopathic you know, being a psychopath was some sort of like wonderful thing, like, ooh, psychopaths, you know, they always know what's happening. This is a wonderful example of how psych- psychopathy is not something anyone would want. It's a dysfunction. It's a dysfunction, and yeah. you will burn out fast. Most people who suffer from higher levels of psychopathy end up in prison like Billy McFarlane. So one thing it reminded me of, in the extreme, granted, because, you know, this wasn't about murder, but you know that I won't name the name, but the, the guy recently who went to prison, uh, I think uh, life in prison uh, because he uh, strangled his wife and two daughters. Yeah. Okay. Horrific story. Uh, well, I saw when I, I watched a lot of the interviews uh, and, and all the film footage from the cop that was interviewed, all these things. I watched all of that and it was unbelievable. The cool that he's able to keep, even in the face of everything crumbling down, his lies come, everything, and he's just like cool and unfazed, like a shark, you know? Right. And again, it's hard to know, because he could have said to, he could have been crumbling on the inside and just could been be. like... I, I guess what I mean is that whatever you call it, whatever it is, that it's so obvious when when you know you see someone go on a stage and they they're nervous and they start like losing their place and it's so obvious they're sweating they're they're stumbling on their words and it's it's clear as day with certain kinds of these people if you didn't know all the background you're like oh there must not be a problem like 
this person's fine. Right. So when you are raised in such a way that you, from an early age, were either modeled to or learned how to lie very well, and you, yeah. and you did, and you had to do it over and over and over again to survive, or again, it was modeled to you in this way, then you just, you're well practiced. It's just a thing you do. It's just a thing you do. And for most of us, we don't have to resort to that because our parents uh, were good to us enough that we didn't have to lie. We, yeah. didn't, we didn't have to develop that skill. And so when we're an adult trying to lie, we start sweating and it starts getting weird for us. You know, and, we, and we, we struggle with we it. We take extra long in answering. <laughs> yeah, there's certain, <laughs> there's certain hallmarks to it. Yeah. Um, or, you know, what happens to a lot of people is even when they should be lying, they don't. Like you see like people being interviewed by police officers yeah. and, you know, they just eventually, they're just like, yeah, I did it. You know, when yeah. you're just like, you don't have to right. tell them that because people have a hard time. Right. They want to please other people. They want to tell the truth. Anyway, right. so let's get to the mass illusion part. I just want to briefly discuss that, you know, this is another way of looking at this. People love a good story. People love a yep. good story. Stories give us meaning. Stories give us hope. Stories give us purpose in life. Stories give us something to look forward to. You know, uh, they sold a story. Yeah. They sold themselves. Uh, one way you could look at it is they sold themselves a story. Oh, it's clear that to a very deep level, both Ja Rule and Billy really believed their own bullshit. So you could say that they were wrapped up in their own fantasy. And you you can see in smaller levels people doing this, you yeah. know? Like, you and I have been in some bands before yeah. where in the beginning we're, we start selling ourselves a story. Yeah. We're the best band of all time. Yeah. We're going to be famous. We're, we're pre-famous. Right. We're already famous. People just don't, just don't know, know it. They, haven't they don't us know yet. us yet. We, all we have is a marketing problem. <laughs> right. That's, that's a story that gives you meaning, right. gives, you, gives you purpose, gives you self-esteem. And, but uh, if taken too far and you have enough yes people around you and enough maybe of investors giving you money, you start actually believing and more and more people start believing because yep. they need to believe. The vendors need to believe because they're going to make millions of dollars. Yep. The, the customers need to believe because they want to have this awesome time. Yeah. Everyone wants to believe this story because they need it to be true. In some ways, when you look at the history behind some of, you mentioned these companies earlier, but some of the very large, very successful companies, uh, when you look at the biographies, the stories and things like that, they, they went through similar moments where they were bluffing to a great extent. They were bluffing. Like take the Microsoft story, right? They didn't really have an OS ready to give my, IBM. They bluffed their way into that deal. Right. But, but they pulled it off. They got a little lucky and they pulled it off. And then it's like, well, I guess we are that thing that we said we were. And so we are, right? Yeah. And in some cases, the lies are smaller. In some cases, they're bigger. Like, it's one thing to say, yeah, we got an OS. And then it's like, shit, we got better go get an OS quick. Yeah. But when you start doing that day in and day in and day out and day out, over and over and over. But I think you and I know enough about business. You know, Seattle is... Filled with entrepreneurs, yeah. startups, blah, blah, blah. And this is a thing that is a well-known practice, whether, oh, it's, absolutely. whether it's explicit or not. But, you know, someone starting a, an app or a website or, I don't know, some other kind of thing today, when you decide to even pre-launch, you talk about it like... Like it's God's gift to the earth. And people are behind it. Yep. And... You have tons of employees. You don't give the exact number. Yeah. But all these people, when it literally could be one guy yeah. <laughs> with a half-baked website right. Right. that isn't functional yet and hasn't right. been beta tested, and upon launch, it falls apart. This right. happens all the time. But right. but you just pick up and try it again. You know, it, right. it's, a, it's a known thing. You never say... Um, I have a product that has never been tested that I'm not sure is going to work. <laughs> and, and That I myself am ambivalent about. <laughs> yeah, and, and statistically, it's probably not going to work out. That's not but how, try it. <laughs> but that's not how you launch things, right? right? Everyone understands right. that 
you know, there's there's bullshit around it. And so he was doing that. And we were, we're it's common among us, you know. Wait, sorry, uh, what, what, what is legally distinguishable is when there starts being fake photocopies of wire transfers yeah. and and explicit legally liable lies, and right? Photoshopped pictures. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it's one thing to say, uh, you know, like one thing that I know business guys will do, they'll be like, they'll be like, um, well, you know, us at our organization, we're thinking about doing this or that. When I know there's only one, one person, <laughs> one dude yeah. is it, you know, he's the, oh, I know I've been in meetings like that too. Like we're, we're talking about the latest line of furniture and, and how we can make the drawer drawers even more fake looking and stuff. And we're sitting there in the meeting and inevitably if we have a partner visiting, someone will be like, Oh yeah, we've got a team assigned to that problem right now. And I know I'm like team. We had the conversation with Bob yesterday. That's not a team. Right. <laughs> so that's lying. Yeah. And accepted. Yeah. Or at least it passes. And it's, you could, and you don't go to that guy and go, dude, you're a con artist. Yeah. So you could imagine, again, in our capitalistic right. uh, culture of entrepreneurship, you can see that Billy might have just been a, a willing to take it to the next level. Right. And there are those, like, you know, so uh, Theranos is another company where uh, sh sh the CEO started falsifying tests and, and making up tests that didn't exist and things like that. Uh, lab tests and lab results and things like that. Uh, Volkswagen. Li right. Lying about. Right. That huge. And they're ruined now, right? Volkswagen is no longer a brand, right? Yeah. They're done. Right. So, you know. So, so I'm not excusing these things, but I think we're both saying, sadly, the reality is that some part of this behavior is way more prevalent yeah. than not. Yeah. And they can't all be psychopathic con artists. So, they're all on the spectrum. <laughs> when you have a system that rewards you for such things or rewards you for, tr for, for taking risks along those lines, yeah. Then you win. So, for example, with Volkswagen or the um, you know the Big Short, yeah, you have a situation where you're pretty sure it's going to work, and if it doesn't work, you're pretty sure the consequences aren't going to be that bad, right? So, eh, I'll roll the dice. Like, I think I've talked about this before. I don't know, but you know, there was a time many years ago where I took a short break, a couple of years break from from my cabinetry work, and. I started a, a startup with with uh, a couple of kids, really. I say kids because they were just out of college, and they, you know, especially the the leader. This kid really blew me away initially. I was like, wow, you know, he's a deep thinker. Him and I would have these deep conversations about topics that we both cared about, and I thought, wow. Like this kid's got it together and he's got just, he's, he's going to be the next big thing. And extremely and, organized. Extremely organized. So very <laughs> charismatic, good looking kid, presented himself with suits, very nicely drove a BMW. You know, he looked the part, right? Yeah. And, and to be honest, like when we would talk, he, w he was smart. Like we had smart conversations. I was like, wow. Uh, but so we started this venture together and at first, I was really believing this this could go somewhere. A good furniture man. Good, yeah. And then all of a sudden, several things started happening. First of all, uh, he needed a place to stay. <laughs> and I offered that he could rent out my place. Now that on itself, you know, startups do this all the time. They move in together, all these kinds of things. So I thought that's fine. Silicon Valley. Yeah, Silicon Valley. But because he was living with me, I started noticing a lot of odd things. Like... You know, the day would start, I would go down and I'd get on the, on, the, on the computer to start mapping out the furniture designs and stuff and working, working hard all day long on this thing. And I'd look over and he's working out, like doing exercises. He's doing like, you know, all sorts of fitness. He bought like the P90X thing. He was doing P90X and like, oh, that's pretty cool. Then he'd get on emails and send emails and, and then he'd talk to people on the phone. I'm like, okay. What are we doing here? You know, like, and we started having arguments about like, what, what's, what's going on, man? What, what, where's the work? 
And you know, he his he was saying like, oh no, I'm I'm working, I'm trying to get investors. I'm trying. I'm like, and I didn't get it. Eventually, we parted ways because I, I I sort of had had enough. I'm like, I feel like I'm doing all the work here. I don't know what's happening, you know. So we parted ways. This kid goes on to get investor money to start another company, gets uh, re super cheap rent in this office space from someone that already had a, another company that he basically charmed into giving him this deal, gets this in, all these investors to give him money and throw the, without building anything yet. And I'm sitting there listening to this because we had like, we did follow up and had lunches every now and then. And I'm like, how? How are you doing this? Because I used to be with him when he would talk and all you do is spin this, these yarns that were 80% BS. Right. So it's possible that he came up with some brilliant business idea and organization and that's how he found the success that he found. Or it's also possible that he is on the spectrum of psychopathic con artists and is- I have an answer. <laughs> what is it? Uh, it was definitely B, choice B. Yeah. Now, and actually, just like Billy, he actually had great ideas. It's not that he didn't have great ideas. Execution, not so much. Yeah. And, but, but what he was absolutely great at was getting money from people. Like, unbelievable. Right. And the way you do that is by potentially not having much of a, of a, of empathy or remorse about spinning a yarn that people want to hear and not caring about the consequences if you don't actually deliver. And so, I want to be clear that in this case, I ni neither ever saw nor have any reason to believe that there was any nefarious or illegal behavior. So it's not like Billy in that regard. Totally. I just mean that he could walk up to someone with money and say the right combination of things that would get him money. And you were kind of one of his victims. Yes, and I was also jealous, sort of puzzled about like, what is this capability that I lack? Yeah. I, I don't feel capable of walking up to someone and bluffing my way into them giving me money. Right, so the difference between <laughs> you and him is that you, one, aren't that obsessed with this. Like you don't, like if you really wanted to put your yeah. mind to learning the skills to do what he does, you could, uh, you could learn those skills, mm -hmm. but you don't care because you have other things you want to do. Yeah. People who have, who have psychopathy, they lack a self. They don't really know what they want. They just are replacing their personality and their desires with this distraction of manipulating other people because yeah. it, it feels like it is valuable you know use of their time but deep down they have needs and wants but yeah. they don't they don't have access to them similar to borderline histrionic and and narcissistic is that they're not really in connection with their true needs because no one has a true need to manipulate other people really sure we have true needs like for attachment for love for safety for security for entertainment for i don't know uh meaning in life but when you aren't connected to those things in your life, you end up adopting other things to kind of distract yeah. or pass time. And right. for the antisocial psychopathic person, they will uh, attach themselves to manipulating other people because, you know, someone like Billy, it's like, uh, you know, who seems totally driven by this, by this behavior. It's like, what meaning do you get out of that? Like, how does that, how do you sleep at night yeah. with with all the things you've done. But the thing is, is that he's not really in connect, you know, people like this are not really in connection with like a core self of like goal directed. This is who I am. These are my principles. Yeah. This is my mission statement. This is what I want. It, there's not a cohesion to it. And that's why when you see psychopaths, and I don't know if Billy has psycho, I don't know if I would label him as psychopathy, as psychopathic if I, if I met him, but he seems to exhibit that. Um, uh, I would, uh, you know, he, if he truly had a sense of self, he would be like, okay, I'm really good at selling things to people. Um, I'm really good at marketing, but what's my overall goal here? What do I yeah. want to get out of it? Well, I don't want to go to prison. Right. I want people to like me. Right. You know, I got to balance it out with that. And um, I want to live after this, meaning yeah. I want to survive the the potential fall. Right. I want to. I want a overall life here. And if yeah. I do this and that, like I'm going to go to prison or I'm going to have to run to Jamaica. That doesn't. So, 
that's that's the key there. So it's anyway. So getting back to the mass delusion part, you know, the make America great again is is one mass delusion among a certain group of people. Right. You could also say hope and change was kind of a mass delusion. Oh, absolutely. Too. It's just like we, you know, in 2008, we wanted to believe yeah. in hope and change. Totally. We wanted to believe that the country could be perfect or better or yeah. safer. Or it was make America great again. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It um, just, two different versions of what that meant. Right. And other politicians <laughs> literally said, make America great again. Yeah. Like, I think Ronald Reagan said that. And so... We want to believe, you know, they sell us a story and we want to believe it. And I guarantee you that uh, the time frame during which the people that say make America great again happened, the politicians at that time were probably saying make America great again. <laughs> totally. Uh, I, just throwing out another mass delusion, you know, all those people who waited in line to see Star Wars Episode One. No one would have done that. All those people who wait in the line. Are you, know, you calling me a mass delusionist? They wanted to believe in a story <laughs> that this was going to be the best movie of all time. They went to the movie and the, the mass delusion carried over for a while. No. They walked out of the movie and they were saying, oh my God, Star Wars Episode One is the best movie of all time. I was running a social experiment, dude. Don't group me into this. So <laughs> you, the power of the delusion. Totally. Because, man. totally. because we grew up with Episode 4, 5, and 6, and you know, Episode 1 came out, what, 15, 20 years later or something. We, want, we needed to believe that there could be another Star Wars I movie know. in our world, and we could relive our, the glory of watching I know. Empire as we did when we were children, we needed as a collective, we needed to believe that and it overpowered our personalities to the point where we were in complete <laughs> denial. Even after watching the movie, yeah. as you said to me, you were like, yeah, that was awesome. You were high-fiving everyone. Uh, totally. Yeah. Be even against all data, <laughs> against all it was reality. as if I had gone to fire and on my way back after spending a night in jail almost, I'm like, wasn't that amazing, you guys? Right. So I just want to point that out that like the fire Festival, when you look at it in the documentaries, you're like, what a bunch of dumb shits. But all of us are susceptible to this. Yeah. We are all lonely. Totally. We all lack meaning. We all want to have cohesion. We all want to have an amazing experience. And when we're sold something, it taps into our deepest needs to have this be true that we will deny all data that gets in the way of us having that story upheld. Yeah. So what's the final word about this, bro? Well, I mean, for me, the most, most telling thing of all of it was when, when it was all said and done, uh, instead of moving to Jamaica, like you suggested, or at least just going into remission, remission for a couple of years or just getting a job somewhere, Billy started conning right away. Right. In a super sleazy. Even more sleazy if that's possible. He, he started to spam his. The same victims. He started to spam the, uh, the people who had bought the ticket. Yeah, the same victims already of his own crimes. He started to spam them with like, like essentially Nigeria need, you know, Nigerian. A hundred percent. It was like the most obvious spam scam unbelievable dude and and then it was like vip access to like jay-z things that were really not available at all and that could be yeah. like to your point earlier checked immediately and again to your point earlier the unbelievable stupidity of it was yeah. that it was an immediate violation of his parole yeah and he, or his he, whatever uh he was out on bail is what it was yeah he, he was on bail and and it was so obvious that it was happening and he wasn't really trying to hide it. Like he right. was doing it with another guy in full view of other people. Right. You know, there were people around him as he's doing it. Yeah. So it, it made me feel really sad for his girlfriend. I don't know that they showed her much in Netflix, but in the other documentary, the Hulu one, which you really should watch because they've paid me to know. Uh, in that one, they showed the girlfriend and the girlfriend loves him and was shocked to find out all of this and was sort of like devastated when he went to jail. You know, she still she was on the interview saying like finding out that there's this other side of him that's essentially, you know, I don't know if she used the word monster, but it was something along those lines. But it's still Billy. Like, I still love him. Like, he can be so sweet, so kind, so, you know, all these things. Yeah. And it was like, wow, that's sad. Well, so that's another thing about it is that you can be a psychopathic con artist 
and still be a loving person. Ted Bundy was reputedly very nice to. Well, uh, yeah, to go to that extreme. Uh, yeah. But he also wanted to cut your head off and, you know. Oh, no, sure. But I'm saying, like, some of the people that knew him said very nice things about him. But uh, to a lesser extent, there are, there's a, you know, say Billy. I don't know, somehow figures out how to con people without getting in trouble or sure. con people legally or something. He could ha have a totally fulfilling totally. marriage. You yeah. know, there's, there's, there's people tend to look at these people as like evil monsters and yeah. it's, it's just not that oh, easy. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So <laughs> I see why you didn't want to. True. So I, I guess uh, you said in conclusion, I, I think we need to all check in with, our little inner voices when we are presented with opportunities in life. Right. And especially when those opportunities seem maybe a little too good or maybe they they uh, they seem like to come out of nowhere. And one of the things is how often do we, any of us, look into who is the promoter for a show or who is the sponsor for an event or never, right? Like we never look into things like that. Well, yeah. So... One of the, if you're a young person and you're susceptible to this sort of thing, I would hope you're not. But if you are, make sure you're no longer susceptible to it anymore. <laughs> you know, this whole idea that Kendall Jenner can make one tweet and right. obviously get paid, you know, that hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it. And for that to influence your decision to do something, I hope you understand how ridiculous that is. They just, like, yeah. The, these social media influencers are just complete bullshit, yeah. you know, or at the very least, you should just take it with a massive grain of salt. You yep. know, it, it, you should even take them with a bigger grain of salt than, than advertisements because an individual doesn't necessarily have the time to vet something, you know, right. channel five will potentially get in trouble if they air an ad that has dubious claims sure an individual social media influencer is like well i don't i, I don't whatever i, I don't Here, have a check yeah i don't have resources so I don't, I don't have a legal team that's breathing to my neck totally they just passed a law in i think the uk because uh they had s problems there too with their with influencers uh posting things not ever disclosing that they were paid advertisements so they now have to explicitly say that it's an advertisement and it can't even be like it's sponsored. It's got to be like it's an advertisement. And the violations include jail time and it, like years, like up to years. Yeah. I, the libertarian streak in me has a bit of a problem with that. I, I mean, I guess it's, I don't really disbenefit from that scheme if, if that happens yeah. in the United States. But on the other hand, it's like, I don't know. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because it's like, on one hand, they're just individuals getting paid to do something. On the other hand, they're basically an, a, a corporation that yep. should be liable for their what they endorse, you know? Yeah. So I kind of get it, but I kind of don't. Anyway. Well, especially because their target audience is youth. Yeah. Yeah. True. I mean... It, so you need some consumer protections out yeah, there. Yeah. I mean, I guess they're not barred from doing it. They just have to disclose... They just a, have to say it's an advertisement. They just have to disclose, essentially, they got yeah. paid to, to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So influencers are bullshit. Marketing is bullshit. Hype is bullshit. This is why we need the flannel to come back. Grunge hated all that shit. And we need a return. You know, I feel like, you know, when, when we, in the 90s, early 90s in Seattle anyway, we, we had a very alternative anti-corporation attitude about things. That's right. And I feel like we've, we've flung so far away from that right. in 2019. The world loves corporations. Yeah. It just it swallows, you know, hook, line, and sinker, obvious advertisements for things without critically looking at it as like, these are marketers selling us shit. And so, you know, don't trust the internet. Don't trust Kendall fucking Jenner. Uh, don't, uh, don't ever go to a festival the first year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about that? Maybe we need to stage an all-night protest at the Space Needle so we can truly get back to being sleepless in Seattle. Oh, my God. <laughs> Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself and never say that joke again because... <laughs> yeah, we all deserve it.